Hi everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Trans Stupid where I take a look at some of the ridiculousness that's been coming out of the trans community as well as the wider world of LGBTQIA++ issues because stupidity is intersectional. So the first thing that I want to discuss today is becoming quite a recurring theme of 2019 and that's trans participation in sport. So which sport is it this week that trans women are clamouring to get involved in? Could it be something like running or swimming? No, it's it's one of the one of the sports that really doesn't rely on testosterone at all, and that is powerlifting. Yep, because there's no way that they could have an advantage after having years, like the vast majority of their life, on testosterone, natural testosterone. But but who am I to know? Stuck on the sidelines. A transgender powerlifter fights for the right to compete. It's not fair to genetically eliminate an entire group of people. Are you talking about eugenics or sport? It's actually quite hard to tell. The first time JC Cooper walked out onto the platform at a women's powerlifting competition, everything else fell away. Her year-long internal struggle over her gender identity, her decision to leave men's sports when she began transitioning, her doubts that she would ever feel safe if she returned to competitions. In a world that wants to take away our power and strength, Cooper said recently, powerlifting is a way to gain that strength back and feel powerful and feel ownership of our own lives. It helps us find strength with within ourselves and helps us find strength within our bodies. Cooper signed up for more competitions, but to her astonishment, USA Powerlifting, the sport's biggest federation, told her she could not compete in the women's division because of her gender identity. In an email, USA Powerlifting said she was denied because she had a direct competitive advantage, really you think, over the other women who were competing. It took me aback, Cooper said. I didn't want to put myself into a situation where I obviously wasn't welcome. Well, you're about to do so anyway, aren't you? As transgender women have become more visible and sought to participate in women's sports, athletic organising bodies have grappled with how to respond and critics of their inclusion have grown increasingly vocal as well. For transgender people watching this issue play out of the debate, often based more in bias and assumptions than in science, is dehumanising. Those who seek to exclude transgender women from sports sometimes imply that the athletes are adopting their identity to gain an edge in competition, a suggestion many find offensive. I can kind of agree that I don't think that is the motivating factor for a lot of these people. Naturally, I can't say that as a complete blanket statement. There's always going to be a bit of an outlier out there. On the other hand, it really, really wouldn't surprise me if there's someone out there who's that desperate for attention that they would transition just for that reason. But at this point, let's be fair to Cooper. Let's imagine that she is someone who has, you know, transitioned at a fairly early age. Someone who didn't have a lot of testosterone in their body going through puberty. Maybe she wouldn't actually have any kind of physical advantage. Maybe she built up some muscles after beginning her transition. So let, let's have a look into her background a little bit. Before becoming a power lifter, Cooper lifted weights as part of her training for other sports. Okay, so you already have experience lifting weights. Neat. As a teenager growing up in Clarkson, Michigan, she was on the US Junior National Curling Team, competed in track and field in high school, and rode in college, but she never felt fully comfortable on those all-boys teams. Four years ago, she began hormone replacement therapy as part of her transition. She now identifies as trans-feminine, which she sees as more expansive identity than simply female. Oh, for God's sake. So... You don't even identifying as a woman. How, you'd think that would be the baseline for you to get involved in this is actually, I'm a woman. I deserve to be in this sport. But no, you, you're beyond women. You transition beyond being woman. You're trans feminine. How the fuck is trans feminine more, more authentic femininity than being an actual woman? How the hell does that work? And what's more, four years ago, you started your transition four years ago. Okay, how old is she then? Is she, you know, early, very early 20s, late teens? Well, no, if we look earlier, she's 31. So she started her transition when she was 27. After years of being involved in sports, after years of having testosterone in her system, being able to build up muscles. Cooper first came across powerlifting in high school, but didn't decide to compete until last year while recuperating from a broken ankle, and she was struck by the sport's simplicity and supportive atmosphere. The barbell for me has been a very empowering way to be in my body, which is politicised every waking second because you politicise it yourself. That's why it's politicised. What was wrong with just transitioning 
And then just that being that. The personal is not political. It's a ridiculous accusation to make. Oh, it's a very almost spiritual feeling in the sense that I'm carrying all of this trauma with me and I'm literally focusing all of that in the barbell. Christ's sake, professional victim as well. I'm getting very tired. I, I feel no sympathy for these people. I am someone, like, as a trans woman, I can get that there are things that we're never going to be able to perfectly align with when it comes with come along to other women. I get that that can be a distressing thing. Enough with the victimhood. This is a sport. You can do other things besides sports. You need to recognise there are sacrifices that you make when you transition. Arguably, being built in the way that you are, you're gonna have to give up competing against women. And with the fact that you're going to be taking testosterone blockers as well as estrogen, that is going to affect your muscle mass. So you might not be able to compete directly against men either. You can't just expect to get everything on a plate. Just for the clarification, it isn't just trans women who are being barred to partake in powerlifting. In fact, trans men are as well because they're taking testosterone. Larry Mayle, the president of USA Powerlifting, has said that they've been referred to as bigoted and transphobic and a whole lot of less kind things for introducing this ban on trans women and trans men. But he goes on to say, it's an issue we have to consider dispassionately and make our best judgment collectively about what the impact on fair play is for us. And that's the basis on which we proceeded. And that's completely reasonable. You're going to need to take everything as it comes. And with something like this, yeah, facts come over feels. I've commented on sports a lot and I know it's something I need to research a lot more. I can't say that I am an authority on this by any stretch of the imagination. But the idea that a trans woman is going to be competing exactly the same as a biological woman in any of these sports, more often than not, that's simply not going to be true. You can't identify out of your biology. You can do things, for example, taking hormones, having surgeries that do certainly change your physicality a bit. I think powerlifting more so than many other sports is one in which the muscle mass that a biological male has gives them such a huge advantage over anyone else. I think this would be a good one for them to pass up. But on to the next story, unless you've been living under a rock for the last several days, you no doubt aware that Avengers Endgame has hit cinemas and it's become the big one of the biggest films of all time in the last few days. It's a film I absolutely love. I'm a massive fan of the Marvel films because it comes under Disney. Guess what? It's courted controversy, apparently, and with the LGBT community. Wow, what, what offensive thing has it done? Because apparently Endgame has the MCU's first canonically gay character. This happens in a scene earlier in the movie. This isn't a spoiler if you haven't seen it, but he's essentially in a support group with Captain America discussing a date with another man. Joe Russo, one of the directors who played the guy, said, Representation is really important. It was important to us as we did four of these films and we wanted a gay character somewhere in there. We felt it was important that one of us play him to ensure the integrity and show it is so important to the filmmakers that one of us is representing that. I mean, it doesn't really kind of add anything to the story at all. It is literally just a side character who comments about going on a date with another guy. No big deal. And in fact, that's what a lot of people's reactions have been. Someone didn't tell Twitter that, though. In fact, on one of Twitter's trending pages, it made an announcement that fans are debating if Avengers Endgame did enough for LGBTQ representation, while some fans are lauding Avengers Endgame on becoming the first MCU film to feature a canonically gay character. That's not what's got the hype up about this film. Others are wondering if the filmmakers could have done more. Now, naturally, because this is current year, there were people who were genuinely offended. One Twitter user posted, LMAO, zoo. We're all starved for LGBT rep, but this is taking credit for doing less than the bare minimum. Another person said, wow, don't break an arm patting yourself on the back. After 22 films, we thought an openly gay, completely anonymous character should have three full lines of dialogue. I love Endgame and I admire these directors, but who, boy, this is a tone deaf moment. And finally, someone else really hit the nail on the head with the controversy, saying Endgame gives us only the G in LGBT and they're not even a superhero in the end game. 
or superhero movies. Truly, truly damning words. But as I said earlier, this wasn't an issue. And in fact, there was a lot of people commenting on Twitter saying, Where, why the outrage? Why do people care about this? And in fact, this is kind of the reason why I want to comment on it. Publications were trying to make this into a big controversy. The fact that Twitter had this as one of their trending topics when there was barely anyone actually being offended by it. In fact, those tweets that I read out were some of the only ones I could actually find where people were genuinely outraged. The rest of them were people saying, why do you all care? And in fact, some publications even posted as though this had been some sort of big problem for Marvel in that they were ignoring the LGBT community. Now, okay, like, first of all, is it really an issue if they don't have a lot of gay characters? Should the Infinity Stones have been pronoun badges? Should Spider-Man have been spider muxen But it's a trending topic, and the media wanted to make more, like, to generate outrage. And I think that, like, for me, this really comes across as something they tried to manufacture. The fact that it has a gay guy in it for half a minute is neither here nor there. Whenever you hear the media saying there is outrage, there is controversy. A lot of the time it's nowhere near as big as they make it out to be. And they just do this to generate clicks, to generate controversy, to generate content that I then comment on. The next story that I want to talk about is one which is a little bit strange. Mother of all legal rows for trans man and his baby, gender reassignment has created a thorny conundrum for the family courts. There once was a woman who wanted to be a man. Let's call her TT. So she took all the necessary steps legally to become a man. Her female biology was retained, but in the eyes of the law, TT went from a she to a he. Then TT did something rather unusual for a man. 10 days after receiving his gender recognition certificate, making his legal transition complete, he went to a fertility clinic and became pregnant through a sperm donor. Thought you had gender dysphoria. Why are you doing one of the most female things on the planet? I don't get trans guys having babies. I'm sorry. I know that I might have some trans guy who follow me. Guys, I don't get it. I'm sure a lot of you don't get it either. You can't be that dysphoric if you're going to become a mother. But I suppose that's not what this person wanted to be. They didn't want to be a mother. In January last year, he gave birth to a son. But it's what happened next that created the conundrum facing the family courts TT was recorded on the child's birth certificate as the boy's mother. As the state had already agreed that he was a man and issued a certificate to prove it, TT believes he should be recorded as the father. Well, you didn't father the child, did you? You were the mother. He has taken his case before Sir Andrew McFarlane, the most senior family judge in the country, to change his status from mother to father. If the court finds in TT's favour, the boy will become the first child under British law without a legal mother. The judge's decision, which is expected later this month, will have enormous consequences. Sir Andrew is not only being asked to weigh the rights of child against the rights of his transgender parents, he must also find a solution that balances long-standing laws governing the birth and death of British citizens with all the other laws that have involved to ensure fairness in surrogacy, adoption, egg, sperm donation, same-sex parenting, and the myriad ways in which modern rainbow families can be created thanks to advances in assisted reproduction. Noir Lamol said that the child's interest must be paramount. It's important for the child's identity to be recorded correctly. The parent has said that he intends to inform the child when he has reached an appropriate age, but say that doesn't happen. The child has a right to find out the truth. There must be protections put in place for a child to be able to ascertain its true identity and to know the full circumstances of its birth. TT wants to be recorded as father, parent or gestational parent, anything but mother, which he claims would unfairly impose the abandoned gender status upon him. But you had a baby, you birthed yourself and you're biologically female. What did you think would happen? Seriously, did you honestly expect that people wouldn't question this? Maybe that this might cause some questions for your child in the future? TT's lawyers argue that making transgender parents register in their previous gender is discriminatory because it denies them access to parenthood in their acquired gender and undermining their trans identity. You undermined your own trans identity by having a baby. Do you have a partner? Are you partners with a woman? Well, why didn't she carry it? Why did you have to carry it? Maybe there's a genuine, genuine question there, but you've got to balance all this out. The idea of me potentially fathering a child was something that massively put me off. I, it's why I had no qualms about having the surgery down there. But with you, that's, this seems to be a little bit different. I, I think it's a, it's such a huge push to be able to assume that people should accept a trans man as a biological father 
when he is the one who is giving birth here. I always found these stories confusing when I was growing up. I remember hearing about Thomas Beatty, a trans guy in America who was the first pregnant man, but it turned out he's biologically female, so it's not that impressive. I get that he doesn't want to be outed in any kind of way, but at the same time, this is just a birth certificate. They're not really used for a lot, and even when they are, they're generally used in confidential cases. So I don't see what the problem is with the way it records it. If you're so sensitive that a piece of paper outing you as a mother is going to be considered traumatic, why did you carry the child? Because I would think that one of those is gonna out you more than the other. Now, if he wants to take a father role, in the raising of his child, I think that's a bit different. If his kid's gonna refer to him as dad throughout, that's that's fine. That's fine because there's language between the family. There's, there's plenty of trans women out there who refer to his mother. There's gonna be trans men out there who refer to his men. I have absolutely no problem with any of that. The problem is that you're trying to have it recorded as you being the biological father or anything other than the mother on a piece of paper that nobody is gonna see. And it's the paper that's the problem, not the fact that you gave birth. If it's that much of a problem, don't do it in the first place. There's plenty of kids out there that you can adopt. Now, one thing that we're all seem to be quite well aware of is that when trans people become activists and they're the ones that are pulled out to the community, they're not necessarily the best representatives of us out there. So which ones have been used, have been speaking to the police? Well, let's take a little bit of a look. Police used violence transgender activists for equality training. Transgender activists with a record of using insulting language or even violence against women have been used for police training, inequality and diversity. Feminists say the use of ideologues for police awareness courses may May help explain cases of officers dealing harshly with opponents of transgender cause. So a lot of these activists, regardless of where they fall in the the whole world of identity politics, they're all going to be ideologues. Name an identity movement and it's going to be the same thing. I agree that the use of ideologues in these issues is a problem because they are not impartial. Trans activists are no exception to that, but they're not gonna be the only ones. But let's actually look at some of the activists in question because I think this is where we'll get to what the real problem is. Among the activists used by police is Kelly Maloney, a transgender boxing promoter who, as Frank Maloney, tried to strangle his then wife, Tracy. I just lost it. I grabbed her and had my hands around her neck, Maloney said in 2015. If my children hadn't come into the room, I dread to think what might have happened. What a nice character she is. What a what a lovely person. And you're, you're going to be telling the police about abuse. Maloney, who has since had gender reassignment surgery, said she also grabbed a couple of other people around the neck in her office. She blamed the frustration of a double life. Again, they, there is not a good record for these kinds of, of activists that police are listening to. And as a result, we're in the absurd situation we are in now, where people put messages online and that is considered the actual issue of the day because it was a mean thing that they said. So who's the next activist mentioned in this piece? Cheryl Morgan, a trans activist from Bristol, described women who disagree with trans ideology as an infestation. Great, great. People who disagree with you are, are vermin. Why is it these people are invited to talk again? However, she was used by Avon and Somerset Police to run equality training, including with cadets. Carol Steele of the group Transfigurations is used for training by Devon and Cornwall Police. In a tweet, Steele appeared to defend the 2017 assault by trans activist Tannis Wood on Maria McLaughlin, who was attending a feminist demonstration at Speaker's Corner. Yeah, trans activists love defending Tara Wood. Okay, so is it Wood or is it Wolf? I keep on hearing her name in, in very different ways, but either way, activists don't like to condemn her for what she did. I'm aware that a lot of trans activists are saying that the Times have an agenda against trans people and that's one of the reasons why they're running these kinds of places as a way of shocking people into thinking this is what trans people are like. And I can certainly understand why that could be an argument after all. The press have their own agenda that they do always try and push. You can't 100% believe every single word that they say. Having said that, these are not things that are outside of the realm of possibility. You've had a lot of activists who have defended Tara Wolf. You have a lot of trans activists who refer to people they disagree with as, as vermin. You have Carolee Maloney being violent to women. 
putting these people forward doesn't help if you're wanting better coverage of trans people, try putting forward more reasonable people to be representatives. Maybe you might start getting better coverage. If we were to have more peaceful activists being put forward and having hit pieces run against them, yeah, I could say that they're being targeted purely just for being trans and not for, other, not for their behavior. But what do you all think of this week's video? Please let me know in the comments. Thank you all for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and also follow me on Twitter and other plugs and I will see you all next time. And a special thank you to Sarah, Kim, Codex and the rest of my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar.